a bit late, but it's okay, I was told. And uh, it always happens like that. Where is Ambassador Vishnu Prakash? Right behind me, yeah. We are old colleagues, so he can take the liberty of what Bush did to Merkel, you know. <laughs> well, my name is uh, Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti. I am a retired diplomat. I ended my career in the Ministry of External Affairs as Secretary for Economic Relations. So I know, diplomacy. and also public diplomacy, yes. That's why they put me here. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> very happy to be here and very happy to have all of you here, friends from Korea. And it's been a good session, candid session, if I may say so. And uh, I will be equally candid if, uh, uh, because otherwise there's no point sitting and talking about only the good things. I think we must also talk about the negative things <laughs> because that is where the problem lies and that is where we need to solve it. Good things will happen, they'll keep on happening. Okay, so we are to look at uh, promoting people to people exchange in brackets public diplomacy. That's the broad template. What is public diplomacy? My definition is it is the management of public perception in, in each other's countries. And globally, I would say, having done public diplomacy, uh, headed the public diplomacy initiative of the government of India for some time, uh, I mm, just like to mention that our first tweet of public diplomacy went out in 2010, for example. That's just a milestone. We, use, we used a lot of uh, social uh, media and many other things. Anyway, that's... I don't want to talk about Indian public diplomacy. I want to talk about the management of public uh, perception, which I call public diplomacy. Now, this management, of course, has to be sectorial, because as we just heard on the economic side, the public perception of India, Korea, uh, trade relations is lopsided, in the sense that uh, the perception in India is about Korea being a much more protectionist, has not given the avenues of for Indian in, uh, exports to, uh, to, to, to be successful in Korea for good reasons from the Korean side, but for us, that's not good enough. And because this public perception about the trade gap is a negative factor. So that is, there is one thing that public perception can lead you to. But there are a lot of other good things. In other domains, we have the, the, the success of Korean companies the Indian consumer, for example, has a very good public perception of, uh, of Korean products and consumer products. So there are differences in different areas. So we have to deal with that and we have to deal with the evolving situation. There is a public perception that the FTAs and the SEPA and all these instruments that India signed with many, many countries is not working for India at least. That it has led to massive ex uh, imports uh, into India but our exports have not picked up uh, that much. Now, there may be ma many good reasons why it has not happened. Ambassador uh, Seshadri has already pointed out some of those reasons. So we have to look at that. So there is a management of public perception of both negative and positive. And so that is what we are going to discuss today and people to people contacts. How many people travel to Korea? How many Koreans come here? I know that, uh, uh, that when I was ambassador in Thailand, I know that more than the million Indians travel to Thailand, for example. So there is a good public perception about Thailand in terms of as a tourist destination and things like that. Uh, and also trade, I think uh, you're doing well in trade as well. So there we are. And I think, uh, let me uh, begin the proceedings by inviting our first presenter, Professor Byung Won. He told me he, he, his name rhymes with young one. So, so Byung Won Wu, from Hancock University of Foreign Studies. So, Professor, your floor is yours. Thank you very much for, uh, for gentle introduction, uh, Ambassador uh, Chakravarti. Yeah, um, it's a little difficult to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope I didn't butcher your name. No, no, you no. got it right. <laughs> So it's my really, uh, real privilege to be part of this delegation, uh, to be a part of this dialogue, and it's my honor to make a presentation in front of such distinguished uh, uh, audience. Um, so, uh, 
my presentation is about South Korean public diplomacy, uh, and I'm I'm um, I'm um, sort of I'm asked to present uh, make a presentation on how to promote people to people exchange between South Korea and in India. Um, so that's going to be uh, more hopefully less contentious issue than the previous two sessions. Um, so I'll I'll talk about briefly about South Korean public diplomacy. Sort of give a uh, brief overview of South Korean dipl uh, public diplomacy, and uh, I'll move on to sort of how to increase uh, people-to-people -people exchange between South Korea and India, sort of under the three pillars of uh, South Korean uh, public diplomacy, which is a uh, uh, cultural public diplomacy, knowledge-based public diplomacy, and uh, policy advocacy. Um, uh, as you can probably see, South Korean public diplomacy. Uh, you know, there is very little that has been done um, uh, sort of between, between South Korea and India. So there is less of an analysis in this presentation and more of a conjecture, suggestions, uh, uh, creative ideas. I'm, I'm really a not, not very a creative person, but hopefully uh, you'll, you'll find some of these ideas creative enough. All right. Okay, so public dipl uh, diplomacy uh, sort of, uh, if, you, if you follow the what uh, international relations scholars calls uh, 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 the school called constructivism. Public diplomacy really can play an important role in creating fr friendly identities between two countries, uh, self and other, which in turn will help facilitate political and economic cooperation that we've talked about in the previous two sessions. And again, the core of uh, public diplomacy is really, uh, I think this, this phrase has, has been pronounced uh, quite a few times today, uh, to win the hearts and minds of people. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, to win the minds of Indians, for instance, that will help uh, uh, pursuing South Korean economic and political interest in India and vice versa. So winning, uh, from the Indians' perspective, winning South Koreans' uh, hearts and minds, for instance, will help uh, uh, pursuing Indians', uh, Indians uh, political and economic interest in, uh, in South Korea. Uh, there is a little uh, transition from old public diplomacy to new public diplomacy. Uh, old public diplomacy, as I understand it, is, is more of one-sided. So it was, it was from uh, governments to people, uh, uh, governments to foreign people engagement. Uh, this new public diplomacy includes a lot more uh, diverse participation of uh, civil societies, uh, academics like us, and and uh, government uh, uh, government officials, and it's uh, it's multi-directional. It's uh, uh, it's interactive uh, uh, diplomacy. So South Korean public diplomacy has a, a, a sort of a short history. Uh, in 2010, they declared that it's a, it's a base year for South Korean public diplomacy. In 2011, uh, they appointed the first public diplomacy ambassador. And by 2017, uh, the budget for South Korean diplomacy. So, you know, uh, despite the hi uh, short history, um, South Korea takes it very uh, quite seriously. Um, increased uh, so the, the budget for South Korean public diplomacy. Let's see if, if this works. Yes, it works. Uh, <laughs> public diplomacy increased from 16 billion one, um, and it's about one billion Indian rupee and 14.5 billion U.S. dollars. Um, and uh, here are four assets that South Korea considered as, as their, their tools for public diplomacy. The first, first one, and I think this is the most important one, achieving successful economic development. That experience, uh, along with uh, uh, democratization, successful democratization, uh, can serve as a model for uh, economic development for a lot of developing countries. Uh, some people go as far as calling it as a sole consensus, uh, as opposed to the Washington consensus or 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 sort of alternative basing consensus. Uh, we are proposing a sole consensus. Um, but even not going that far, uh, we, can, we can think of uh, South Korean success story or that experience as, as, a, as a model for economic development. And it can also, you know, so, sort of, it's only a few countries, among a few countries who've made that transition from developing countries to develop, developed countries, so it can serve as a bridge between developing and uh, developed countries. So that's the first asset. The second one, um, South Korea never invaded any other country around it. So South Korea has, has that reputation as, as a peace-loving country. And South Korean people, I don't know how you see us uh, as a delegation, but has a reputation of diligent people as, as a national brand. 
South Korea also has a dynam uh, very dynamic culture, so uh, di uh, dynamic and uh, diverse cultural contents. Uh, most recently, those are sort of uh, called as Hallyu, which is um, which is a little translation uh, it can be translated into Korean wave. Um, and this Korean wave uh, initially uh, started as a sort of the pop cultures, uh, K-pops and K-dramas now. Uh, sort of uh, expand beyond uh, those uh, K-pop and K-dramas in to include K-food, uh, Korean food, and um, K-beauties, uh, beauty products, skincare products uh, 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 by South Korea. Uh, here are main uh, public diplomacy projects of South Korea. So uh, spreading attractiveness of Korea, seminars, forums, ex ex uh, exhibitions, and, and concerts, um, just like what we hold here. Uh, so this is a part of our public diplomacy mission. <laughs> um, and then there is Korea con contest, uh, Quiz on Korea K-Food uh, World Festival, K-Pop World Festival. There was one uh, K-Pop contest uh, uh, last year in, in India, for instance. Um, there's a local tour caravan creating Korean corners at uh, major universities, libraries, and cultural centers. And again, uh, there's, there's one that's planned um, um, uh, by a Korea Foundation this year that I'll, I'll discuss later. Uh, supporting K-lovers. Uh, surprisingly, there is a K-pop lovers in India. Uh, there's a Facebook page. I was, I was doing a, a little bit of research uh, to prepare for this uh, presentation, and I found their Facebook page. Um, so the, uh, supporting those, those K-lovers is a part of uh, uh, a broader public diplomacy project. And appointing foreign celebrities as um, goodwill public uh, Korea public diplomacy ambassadors. Um, that's another part of um, of uh, uh, Korea's uh, public diplomacy project. With that, there is uh, three strategic pillars of South Korean uh, public diplomacy. The first one is cultural public diplomacy. So. Uh, this is obviously sort of rooted in, in advertising more K-pop, K-drama uh, K uh, products. So advertising attractiveness of Korean culture, elevating uh, Korean brand image, utilizing cultural resources, and promoting communication through cultural exchanges. So that's, that's the first pillar. The second one is to teach Korean to teach uh, things about Korea, Korean cultures. So, so that's, no, uh, that's what I termed as knowledge-oriented public diplomacy. So that consists of uh, promoting better understanding of Korean history, tradition, and economic and political development status, sort of the playing one of the assets of South Korea, promoting Korean studies and learning um, Korean. The third one is policy advocacy. So utilizing uh, public diplomacy to promote uh, the, the policies of South Korea. So promoting understanding of major policies of Korea, extending boundaries of public diplomacy, and strengthening policy-oriented public diplomacy toward foreigners uh, residing in, in South Korea. So here are, uh, so, so I've, uh, I'll make some suggestions uh, under these three pillars, but before going into that, uh, here are some things to consider to, uh, to, to when we think about how to increase people-to-people -people exchange between South Korea and India. First of all, relatively few people-to-people -people exchange uh, exist thus far. So, you know, most visitors are for business purposes. So last year, for instance, uh, Indian visitors to South Korea was about 200,000 people, but most of them were uh, 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 there on, uh, on, on business purpose. Um, there were about 110,000, if I remember it correctly, uh, South Koreans visiting India last year. Again, uh, they are mostly, you know, visiting India for uh, for business purposes. Um, only very few Koreans know India, and I'm guessing, or as I, I as I read from this book, actually, you know, very few. Uh, this book is uh, by Ambassador Tayal. Uh, if you have re haven't read it. Uh, <laughs> It's an excellent book. Um, so probably same is true for, for Indians. Um, and, and this you know, unknowns, um, superficial knowledge about each other can lead to biases and prejudices. Um, so that's the first thing to consider. So the second one is the goal of South Korean diplomacy. Sort of when I think about from the South Korean perspective, uh, South Korean public diplomacy should be how to, uh, 
how to move from acquaintance. We know each other, but we are not really close friends. So how to move from sort of acquaintance to friends. So uh, with, that, with that in mind, uh, here are you know, four things that uh, public diplomacy should, should, uh, um, should focus on. Uh, it should focus on uh, uh, sort of introducing Korea rather than advertising Korea. And I think there is a certain, certain difference. So, you know, it's, you know, it, it's in, it, advertising is with purpose. Introducing is, is more, you know, I'm here, this is me. Uh, sort of, and I think that's the first step. Um, also, it should be focused on longer term projects. You cannot really, you know, seek to have sort of short term results. Um, and I think that doesn't fit with uh, the, the purpose of the public diplomacy. Winning hearts and minds of people requires time, right? Um, unless you're you're beautiful or handsome and. <laughs> <laughs> Then it doesn't require too much time. Uh, public diplomacy <laughs> should focus on cultural knowledge-oriented public diplomacy, and when it comes to the uh, sort of the policy advocacy, uh, it should be uh, it should be again you know the first step should be you know it's, we are we are genuine sort of showing that we are genuine in, in pursuing to build this uh, relationship uh, between South Korea and India. With that, uh, I'll move on to the sort of a number of proposals <laughs> for cultural public diplomacy, uh, focusing on arts and cultures. So there are a small but growing number of K-pop and K-drama enthusiasts in India. Um, and this, this is especially true in the northeast regions of, uh, of India, uh, Manipur, uh, Nagaland, etc. And there is a growing online community um, interested in uh, South Korean project, but you know I think that that tends to be limited thus far. So uh, this year, Korea Foundation plans to hold a Korea Festival in October 2018 in New Delhi, Mumbai, and Chennai, and and, and possibly in in more cities. Uh, beyond that, I think we can think about sort of a joint music and movie festival, especially movie, given that, you know, Indians love movies um, and Koreans also love movies, uh, if you if you haven't, haven't noticed it. So, and, and um, you know, it doesn't need to be bilateral. It can actually go multilateral or regional. So I think we can think about Asian music festival, a Asian movie festivals um, happening sort of in India, South Korea, and uh, east of India, south of South Korea. And that was the theme, right? New, with the new southern policy of South Korea, look east policy of, of India. You know, we can also uh, hold, uh, you know, these are uh, arts events um, uh, somewhere in the middle. And also, uh, I was, when I was thinking about sort of introducing South Korea, introducing India to South Koreans, in, introducing Korea to so South, uh, introducing Korea to Indians, um, I think it would be interesting to do sort of art exhibit tours featuring cultural, historical, and religious artifacts uh, from South Korea, Southeast Asia, and India. And they can really highlight the common but differentiated cultural heritage found in, in this region. So um, I think that would, be, uh, that would be a really interesting uh, tour. Similarly, uh, Sort of highlighting the Buddhist culture, uh, Buddhist Buddhism tours uh, featuring Korean, Indian, and Southeast Asian countries, temples, and religious sites um, can be promoted as a part of a cultural uh, public diplomacy project. Moving on to the tourism, uh, uh, South Korean tourists in India um, have been growing through the 2000s, but uh, has been stagnant in 2010 at about uh, 100,000 uh, persons uh, visitors per year. But I think there is a growing interest in tourist sites in India. For instance, there was an uh, International Day of Yoga, and the, the, the event was held in, in South Korea uh, a week ago, about a week ago, um, last weekend. Um, and, and there were quite a few participants. So there is a growing interest in India. Um, but what we see is here. So this is a, a sort of uh, the data that I've, I've gathered from Korea Tourist Organization. And I've uh, sort of made a chart of annual Korean tourists uh, to selected countries sort of around this area. 
if you look at it, uh, there are uh, quite a few trends that you can read. Um, so uh, the first, first trend that I can read is Koreans love to travel. Right? So there's a big increase in, in, in travelers uh, in, 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 in South, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, so if you look at the, the uh, green line and the red line, the, that's uh, the Philippines and the Vietnam. So there's obviously a big increase in, in tourists to Vietnam and the Philippines. Um, the dark blue line, that's India. So there's a, uh, the number is, is around 50,000 between 2004 to 2009. And in 2010, it jumps to about uh, 100,000 people. But it's, again, it's stagnant. Uh, in between, what you see is the Laos, um, which is pretty interesting case. Laos, there is a, uh, the tourist to Laos was minimal. Minimal until 2012, and it's taken off. And in 2015, it's, it's about the double the size of uh, tourist to India. So obviously, there are many reasons of why this is happening. But, uh, you know, but one of the reasons is this, right? South Koreans can visit Vietnam, the Philippines, and Laos visa-free, uh, uh, at least for, for a month or so. Uh, but there, there's an e-visa requirement for South Koreans to travel to India. And uh, in comparison, uh, visa on arrival is available for Japanese citizens along with the e-visa requirement. So, you know, if a Japanese citizen wants to travel to India, they can come here and get a visa at, 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 the, at the point of uh, arrival. But for South Koreans, that's not uh, possible. So visa on arrival is not available for South Koreans, but I think it would certainly help to attract more Koreans to India. It's, it's less of, one less of a hurdle um, uh, to come and visit um, incredible India. Right, um, and, and, and we can think about visa, uh, visa waiver program um, in the medium term. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, it's, we can also think about uh, promoting sort of um, uh, uh, products, right? Uh, travel uh, programs, packages. So the Indian Tourist Develop Corporation and the Korea Tourism Organization needs to work with commercial partners, including airlines, hotels, restaurants, and travel agencies to design affordable packages to three to seven days tours. And this is not my idea. If you like the idea, all credits to me, but if you don't, uh, it's actually lifted from this book. Uh, but unfortunately, what had happened, this book was written in 2013, right? Um, and since then, that, that, uh, there hasn't been uh, much improvement. Um, so this is some, so, uh, an area, again, uh, we can, we can uh, focus on. Um, also, you know, it's, I don't know how many Indians know that they can travel to Jeju with visa free. So they can just go in, to fly in. Yep. So South Korea can advertise that Indians can visit Jeju Island without a visa. And that's uh, a top tourist attraction in South Korea. So. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to the second pillar of uh, public diplomacy. I think I'm spending too much time, probably. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to keep short. Um, so uh, a Korea Foundation plans to open Korea Corners at the uh, University of Delhi and uh, JNU um, later this year. Um, more broadly, educating Korean and Korean cultures uh, can serve again as, as, a, as an important uh, part of uh, knowledge-oriented public diplomacy of South Korea. Anecdotes, uh, talking to my friends, uh, friends uh, from India, says, uh, you know, they say that uh, there is a lot of demand for, uh, you know, learning Koreans, especially with the presence of large multinational corporations from South Korea and in India. Uh, for instance, one of the uh, sort of the premier institutions that teaches Korean and Korean culture is King's Hejong Institute, um, and there are only three in India. And compare that, uh, and that's uh, two in here in New Delhi and one in Chennai. But if you uh, you know if you think about you know if you count the number of uh, King's Hejong Institute, and I did it manually, uh, so there might be an error. Uh, China has 26 uh, King's Hejong Institute, um, and Vietnam, uh, it's much smaller country, but has uh, uh, 15 of them. So, 
we can uh, certainly think about how to increase uh, uh, Sejong Institute in, in, in India. Uh, uh, in my understanding, it, it has to be applied by uh, an entity. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, you can work with um, probably our, our embassy here. Also, we can think about use exchange between South Korea and India. Um, you know, it's, uh, South Koreans are uh, South Korean high schoolers, uh, for instance. They are very interested in building their resume for college entrance. Um, and uh, model UN for those who are studying in social sciences, who, those who want to st study social science, is a big part of their uh, resume builder. So we can think about model UN competition for high schoolers, for instance, between uh, South Korea and India, and between college students as well. Uh, more broadly, uh, both South Korea and India boost themselves as, you know, uh, sort of, we train really well uh, in, in science, technology, and mathematical mathematics. So we can uh, probably plan a, a mathematical competition between those two countries. Um, in moving on to the, uh, the the college again, this is probably because I'm in uh, I'm employed by a, by a university, but you know I'm interested in sort of increasing more students coming from India. So there is a great demand for higher education in India. For instance, if you probably know it, but uh, the uh, the most foreign students in in the United States come from China, of course, uh, but the second most come from India. Uh, and the same is true for uh, a lot of uh, European European countries. Uh, South Koreans, uh, again, you probably do not know it, but South Koreans attract a lot of foreign students uh, more recently. But, uh, you know, and there's a small font, uh, there's a list of uh, ten, uh, top 10 countries that sends uh, students to South Korea, and that doesn't include India, right? Um, but uh, Korean universities, uh, Korean universities are uh, known for their competitiveness. Um, so, you know, uh, in for instance, in, in, in newly released uh, QS World University rankings, rank five Korean universities in global top hundred. So that's a, you know, that's a good source. Um, so Korean universities, I would argue, that could be a good alternative to American uh, European universities for Indian students. And uh, Korean universities uh, experience a lot of shortage of students, uh, talented students coming to their uh, to them. So this could be a win-win between uh, talented Indian students and uh, South Korean universities. So uh, what we can do, uh, more public-private partnerships to create uh, additional educational opportunities, scholarships uh, for talented Indian students to pursue higher degrees in South Korea. Um, so here's uh, uh, sister cities. Uh, another area where I think we can increase more context um, is city-to-city uh, or -city state-to-province province to, uh, state to province cooperate, uh, 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 partnership. Um, I was trying really hard to find uh, existing sister city partnerships, but I, I was only able to find uh, Ulsan and Chennai, and obviously there is a Hyundai link there, uh, and Busan and Mumbai. Outside of that, there is no sister cities uh, 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 relationship. Um, if you look at uh, Seoul, Seoul is pretty active in pursuing sister cities partnerships, but that does, doesn't include any of the Indian cities uh, here. So. What we can propose, what we can, you know, it's, uh, New Delhi is a capital city, Seoul is a capital city, so we can build a, you know, a sister city relationships. Um, but I, again, I think this, this idea, I thought uh, this is a brilliant idea, uh, but then I was reading this book, and the, uh, <laughs> this book uh, lists actually a failures of uh, all your attempts to build uh, sis uh, sister cities or province to province partnerships. But I think uh, sort of the renewed attempt to build uh, sort of the uh, partnerships between local governments would, would serve us well, especially thinking about uh, sort of a Koika's role in India's development, right? Given that Koika projects are generally smaller compared to uh, other <laughs> development agencies such as JICA by, uh, in Japan, Koika needs to play its strength, and one of its strength is its develop, uh, experience in development, right? More recent development uh, in economic development. So partnerships between Koika and local government sister cities uh, 
uh, and development agencies of provinces and local universities it was, it would be a sort of the good model for, for uh, coming up with uh, Koika projects. I will skip policy advocates because, and I'll skip this part as well. All right. Thank you. <laughs> like that, but uh, but clearly, uh, I think. Uh, but you you've done a great job in highlighting the deficits <laughs> that exist in public diplomacy, and clearly there are deficits. We are in a bubble of trade and economic and exports and imports, which is not creating a positive public diplomacy uh, image for South Korea, and I think we need to break out of that because there will be negatives, positives, everything, but. We have to build the positives. And I, I, I completely agree that uh, tourism is a one major thing because having handled it myself in Thailand, I know how positive it, it can contribute. And one of the things that, uh, that can be done is an annual, or not an annual, maybe a tour operators conference. Uh, let's not get the government agencies trying to do these things. I have discovered through my career that if you get the tour operators to come and meet each other, they'll create the business. And, uh, and it has happened all over the world. And this, uh, I, I have empirical evidence uh, to give you, but I shall not at this stage. The other, of course, is education, which is also very important. And I think the, um, the, the figures speak for themselves in the sense of how many centers you have in India with 1.2 billion people or 3 billion people, and how many you have in Vietnam. So I think that a lot more effort from the Korean side is required. I'm afraid that is, that is the conclusion that many of us have reached, and I think we should. Uh, <clears throat> what is important is long-term visibility. Yeah. Long-term visibility in the public, public domain. I think that is public diplomacy. So, Vishnu, you've done a lot on all this, uh, having been ambassador to, of India to, uh, to, to Korea. So now tell us, tell us about the deficits and the positives. <laughs> well, Anyong Hashimnika, namaste. I am absolutely delighted to be among friends, amongst Korean friends and, of course, Indian friends. Korea is a country that I have fallen in love with. Uh, and not just Korea, I have served in almost every East Asian country, uh, Japan, China, Russia, if, in fact, the eastern part of Russia, US. But uh, Korea, I think I have always said publicly and privately that Korea is the greatest success story of the 20th century. And uh, what Korea has achieved is amazing. Let me also t take this opportunity of congratulating my Korean friends for, and through you, the people of Korea, the leadership of Korea, for achieving the impossible. And I'm saying very consciously achievement because after being a Korea watcher or a watcher of the Korean Peninsula for 20 years, for the first time I'm hopeful of what has happened uh, in terms of the thaw uh, of inter-Korean relations for the simple reason that what has been achieved this time is reasonable, it is workable, it is not punitive, it is not loaded against anybody, and that gives me hope. And uh, in all my writings in Delhi in the last few months, I have been saying again and again that full credit goes to uh, President Moon Jae-in. His diplomacy is studded with three attributes, uh, which is unique to his diplomacy. It is S S S S. S and S. One is he is suave, he is sober, and his diplomacy is uh, statesmanlike. His greatest strength, as I, as I see it, is that he believes in giving credit, not taking credit. And that has been the greatest achievement of how he has managed to swing things. Well, that said, that's, that said, uh, let me turn to the topic at hand. I got an uh, early feel of pub the importance of public diplomacy within six weeks of my arrival in Seoul. I reached in January 2012, and in March 2012, Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, came on an official visit to Seoul, and we were at the Blue House at uh, lunch, uh, and uh, President Lee Myung Bak was the president, and uh, you know, suddenly uh, my prime minister's wife turns to me and asks me, Ambassador, how many Indians are there in South Korea? 
So like a good ambassador, I had mugged up all the uh, uh, the figures, the sentences, and I promptly said, Madam, the, 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 the. And uh, the spouse of President uh, Im Myung Bak, Mrs. Kim Yoon Ok, intervened. And we were on a table of six people, only Dr. Manmohan Singh, my, his wife, uh, the two presidents, and uh, the ambassador, Korean ambassador. And she said, little assertively, ambassador, you don't know how many Indians are there in Korea? Now, imagine the fate of the ambassador who was just six weeks old in a country who, and in front of the prime minister, his prime minister, he's told that he does not even know how many Indians are there in South Korea. So, <laughs> so it happens, is it? Well, uh, thank you. I mean, I went shock white. I don't know what happened. All I know is that she said, ambassador, you know, there are 5 million Indians in South Korea. And she went on to say, I'm also an Indian. And she said, you know, she narrated the story of Princess Suri Ratna. And Ambassador Siddharth, uh, Ambassador Skun's book had not been published. So I had not, didn't have the advantage of that. And she narrated how the Indian princess went to South Korea in the year 48, married Kim Suro Wong and became the queen of Korea. I started breathing again, <laughs> you know, so. The, that was my introduction to the importance of people-to-people -people relations, uh, the importance of heart-to-heart -heart ties, and to public diplomacy. And thereafter, there was no stopping me. I went around saying, look, I'm in the land of my cousins. I'll do what I want to do. And I did it, you know, and successive ambassadors have done that. Well, I am very convinced, and as my fellow uh, colleagues are, that the strength of any relationship depends on the, uh, the intensity of people-to-people -people relations, uh, the goodwill that two countries enjoy, and frankly, the, the importance of public diplomacy cannot be overestimated. India and South Korea are blessed. Uh, we have uh, no divisive issues. We don't have a historical baggage. In fact, uh, we have similar priorities. Uh, so you have to give me my remote. <laughs> we have similar priorities, uh, outlook and challenges, priorities, the development priori developmental priorities, challenges, the security challenges. Uh, I mean, in some cases, we are talking of the same country. We may have uh, slightly different outlooks. We may have an immediate challenge. You may have a latent challenge, but challenges are there. And why has this stopped functioning? Uh, yes. And yes, there is a convergence uh, between the India's active policy and uh, uh, Korea's new southern policy. Although, uh, as one of my colleagues, Korean colleagues, had said that the policy is evolving, but uh, certainly we are looking at the world in a similar way. Uh, but yes, as uh, many of my colleagues from the Indian side and the Korean side have ha said, uh, that we also have a challenge, and that is that we have an information and perception gap. And we need to create better awareness. My job has been made easier by Mr. Wu. Thank you uh, from the very, very valuable perspectives that you gave. I particularly liked your comment that India and Korea need to introduce themselves, not to advertise themselves. I think that's a very, very important point that you have made. Thank you, sir. And we have to strengthen heart-to-heart -heart ties, but even heart-to-mind ties. And there is a big difference. Heart-to-heart -heart is all emotional. Heart-to-mind is logical. So I think uh, uh, the India-Korea ties are uh, not just, there is not just the emotional con uh, quotient, but also the logical quotient, which needs to be. And that me brings me to the images. You know, one thing I did in my three and a half years in Korea is practically every month I went to some university or the other in, uh, in Korea, across Korea, Seoul, uh, uh, Busan, various. And I would start off by doing a uh, straw poll. I would ask my uh, young young friends to say, what is the word that comes to your mind when you think of India? And I told them to put their uh, smartphones down because the moment you gave a Korean a smartphone, he had all the answers, <laughs> you know? So they would put this. And amazing what they had to say. There were six or seven words that came to their mind. Yoga, Bollywood, naan and chicken curry, 
Buddhism, caste, caste system. Uh, they would very always all, very often talk of the caste system. Taj Mahal and IT. Now that was India. Now, I mean, it, very very true. I was very impressed that they they had these images of India and Bollywood in particular. I mean, God bless Bollywood for being able to do what we diplomats and the tourist department has not been able to do. When I would ask my Korean young Korean friends and everything, have you seen Three Idiots? I mean, the hands would go up like this because everybody in Korea seemed to have seen Three Idiots and. I sent several thank you notes to Amir Khan. He did not respond to even one. But uh, I mean, the, uh, that is the kind of achievement that Bali. But India is more than uh, just three things, these five things. And similarly, the image of Korea, if you look, very positive, very positive, but limited. If you ask the, uh, the Indians' kids or even the grown-up youngsters, they will say, "Tech, it's a tech power." Chable is my usage. Uh, they will not say Chable. They'll say Hyundai, Samsung, uh, LG. Uh, they'll say Hallyu, but more in the northeast, as Mr. Wu said, and that uh, you know it's a prosperous country. But Korea is much more than that. So there is a in India there is an inadequate awareness about the fascinating Korean history, the cultural richness, the natural beauty. I, we need. Korean and Indian friends to do something about it. And yes, there is limited tourism in both directions, as uh, has been mentioned, though growing, because we had a communication. They also had, uh, you know, limited connectivity, but that's improving. Now we have about 19 flights a week between the two countries. We can do much more. Uh, I have come up, like Mr. Wu, with some suggestions, but my suggestions are that of a practitioner. Uh, having kind of uh, engaged in this business for a long time and uh, also some things which one could do, some things which one failed to do. And with the benefit of inputs from colleagues like Skantayal, I spoke to my very good friend Vikram Durai Swami and the others. So I have tried to pool uh, a bunch of suggestions that have come uh, my way. And uh, well, the most important thing in my view is to catch them young. Start with the school kids. It's a low cost option, low cost endeavor, but you are building, you are develop, you are impacting positively the minds of a future generation. And these are impressionable minds. Unlike many of us who will say, ha, 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 I mean, uh, the youngsters will, will listen, will be attentive, will... So let's start. It's already been done. I'm not, I, I'm not, what I'm sharing with you is not rocket science. I mean, it has been done. It is being done. But all I'm trying to do is to catalog it, improve upon it wherever it's possible, and sequence it. So in my view, we should start off with at least one school per city in both the countries, and which I don't like the word being adopted, but at least, you know, we can connect with the school. And what do we do? Let's start with translated books. Now, again, in my three and a half years in Korea, when youth used to come or uh, Indians used to come and one would interact with them, after about one week in Korea, what fascinated them? Children and grown-ups alike. Indians, I'm talking of, bibimbap. I used to share with them a storybook that, that had been given to me by uh, Dr. Yongil E. Which, which he had translated uh, about how bibimbap was, was developed. Fascinating story. It also shows cooperation. It also shows innovation. It also shows how to put, you put up with hardship. I mean, Indians were fascinated. Similarly, the story of King Sejong the Great, how Hangul was, uh, uh, was invented. The story of the turtle ship designed by Admiral Lee, uh, the Korean developmental story since 1953, amazing things. So with very little cost, uh, storybooks can be developed in English, uh, which you can use for other countries also, but certainly in Indian schools, which can be given out to the kids. Again, Korea has a rich heritage or has a wonderful film industry which about which we do not know. And, uh, you know, some of the Korean films. I'm talking of India, but we, let's talk about Korea. I mean, it's all reciprocal. Uh, you know, there could be screening of popular films in schools, hosting painting and essay competitions, quiz competitions, expose the kids to cuisine, attire, language. 
And you know, that is something that we have, at least in the embassy from, uh, I know from uh, my friend Skun's time and my time and my successor's time, we have been doing regularly across Korea uh, with the help of our cultural center and amazing impact. At times there are thousands of Korean kids when we go to universities and schools in Korea and you know, just do these very simple things. Doesn't cost a thing, but the impact is huge. What is the objective? In my view, in 10 years, let's try to cover each major city or as many major cities as possible. Then set up youth exchanges, not set up, but step up youth exchanges. Now here I have a suggestion, again in consultation with my Indian friends. Hitherto, hitherto the youth exchanges have been on a G to G basis, government to government basis. You know, governments pick up uh, youths. Now how can a 45 year old be a youth? Don't ask me. Uh, but somehow, you know, the, when at least when I was in Korea at times, people used to show up and say, I'm youth. I said, okay, if you are a youth, that's fine. But point is that let us move just out of or go beyond the, uh, the D, G2G and look at P, P to P, PPP, public-private partnership model. What is my thought? The thought is that institutions like Hoofs, institutions like Yonsei could take the lead tie up with an Indian uh, university, tie up with industrial houses in Korea and in India. Imagine a situation when on a reciprocal basis, a college kid who is selected not by the government, but by the universities, uh, who comes to, goes from, let's say the Jawaharlal University, 10 kids go to uh, Yonsei or Hoofs, spend a month learning Korean, Thereafter, they kind of do an internship of one month, six weeks, four, eight weeks with an Indian institution, Indian industrial house or a Korean industri industrial house in Korea and vice versa and come back. Now, the cost will not be high because it's being done on a reciprocal basis. The impact will be huge. And I think this will be much more meaningful than uh, just G2G, but we should continue with G2G. So, I mean, this is the kind of summer in the, uh, in internship programs that can be developed and obviously they can spend a few days with the embassies also. Well, certainly more chairs of Indian and Korean studies, Hindi and Korean language studies in universities. I mean, I was a regular visitor to Hoofs and I would like to compliment Hoofs for what they are doing in terms of creating uh, a very bright youngsters who speak fluent Hindi. Some of them uh, we invited to uh, invited them to join our embassy in Korea. Some of them have become interpreters. I mean, amazing uh, kids and very, very uh, fond of India. So sim similarly, things can be done. Cultural centers are a welcome step forward. India has two cultural centers in Seoul and Pusan. Korea has uh, one in New Delhi. The Pusan Cultural Center is again an amazing experiment in PPP. Uh, here we had a young Korean who was fascinated with India. He, we reached out to him and government, uh, the ICC, our Indian Council of Cultural Relations, joined hands with him. So he, uh, the, the young Korean national, took care of part of the costs and things and government of, or the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, which is the, uh, the partner of Korea Foundation, took care of the next and the Pusan Center is doing very well. Now, two, tourism road shows. But with a slight difference. Let me give you an example of what we did twice uh, in 2013 and 14. We tied up with the Indian tourism, got complimentary air tickets, got uh, hotel stays for a week, travel, all uh, complimentary. Then reached out to a Korean media house. Once we did it with Korea Times, once we did it with Jungang Ilbo. No cost to us. And did a week-long quiz competition Every day they would, or every second day, they would publish a quiz. Uh, they got publicity, we got publicity, tourism got publicity. And uh, then we kind of, with great ceremony, we selected the winner, uh, two winners, and gave, provided them with return tickets, one week of complete hotel stay, travel, food, etc., on a complimentary basis. And we, I think we did get some mileage. So let us kind of look beyond and look, as Mr. Wu was saying, just let's look beyond what the government and, in fact, what my colleague Ambassador Pinak Chakrati, Chakrati was, was saying, Chakravarti, that we should kind of look beyond just the government and uh, involve different players so that the impact is much more meaningful. 
Similarly, uh, we can institutionalize media exchanges, uh, which are uh, visits exchanges of journalists, which is at the moment. Now, the other thing that we are doing with a number of countries, but unfortunately, it has not happened with Korea, and I also failed. Uh, I'm sure my colleague, Yang, uh, Vikram, would have succeeded by now, is to have a regular column on socio-cultural aspects in national dailies. Now, visualize the situation. Chosang Ilbo, Jungang Ilbo, and Times of India, Hindustan Times have a tie-up. A weekly basis, content is provided by one side to the other on the socio-economic, uh, socio-economic, uh, uh, socio-cultural issues, which is translated and published. Now, it's a column which I think any good newspaper will want to do for uh, because uh, you know the, these two countries are reasonably important. I'm not saying that India figures among the top four in, uh, top four countries of priority for Korea, but as we know in the new southern policy and before that, I mean India is important to Korea. Korea is important to India. So I guess something like that again can be uh, done on a regular basis without any cost to the government. Now. Promotion of commercial releases of dubbed feature films is, you know, in, look at India, 1.3 billion people. A successful Indian movie is easily seen by 500 million, not 50 million. You are a country of 50 million. We are a small country of 1.3 billion people. <laughs> so a successful movie can be seen by between 500 million to a billion people. Now visualize a Korean movie which is dubbed. And Korean movies are amazing. And, uh, you know, is seen by 500 million, 300, or even 100 million people. They get such first-hand exposure to South Korea. Your local, your beauty, your culture, your... And similarly, Indian movies are a great messenger or an ambassador of India. Uh, I did mention uh, the success of Three Idiots during my time. I'm told that some other movies have done well. But the best part is that we have a similar societal issues. Uh, we have our movies cover similar issues, youth issues, relationships, respect and care for elders, excessive competition, uh, anxiety, social stress, societal pressures, materialism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I guess this is something which can naturally strike a chord with the other side. And there's something amazing which has happened in, in the recent couple of years, the success of Indian movies in China. Now, every three months, an Indian movie is released commercially at a very wide scale in China. A movie called Dangal by Amir Khan means wrestling, earned $200 million in China. I mean, I'm not boasting about the, the figure. What I'm trying to say is that if it has earned $200 million, you can imagine how many screens it was shown on and for how many weeks and months it played. So uh, why can we not? We, this is a very old idea. I mean, we can perhaps think of the a movie co-production involving the... Am I seeing the watch? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, co-production on the life of Princess Suri Ratna. Imagine what it can do to the relationship. I think all our efforts can be encapsulated and can be multiplied by one movie on Princess Suri Ratna, Queen Ho Wang Ok, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, with with a lead being played by an Indian actress and a, obviously an Indian actress because she'll be the princess and uh, a Korean who will be the King Suro Kim Suro Wang, if possible. Let's try to do that, if not now, after five years. But I think this will be a big ticket item, a game changer. By the way, I've been told that, uh, uh, you know, we are the government of uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is the biggest state of India, is taking a huge initiative. You know that the, the legend relates to Gimhe province, Gimhe city in uh, Korea and uh, Ayodhya city in, she was the princess of Ayodhya in India. And for the first time, the chief minister is organizing a Dipotswa, which is called a festival of lights at Ayodhya to commemorate this great journey. And oh my God, what have I done? This is no, this, believe it or not, this is November 2018, not, not <laughs> 20,100. 
I mean, I'm I'm perceptive. I must compliment myself. But yes, this is this is November 2018, and has invited a uh, uh, Korean dignitary to be a chief guest. And our chief minister is like the, your governor, and he's the governor of the biggest province. And the response is awaited. So I guess um, uh, something like that uh, should be of interest. And I solicit your support uh, in. Uh, letting uh, our Korean friends know that this will be an event which will be worth their visit. All right. I mean, same goes to televised, uh, tele televising of dubbed soap operas or drama serials, uh, which can be exchanged. We both our countries do very good drama serials, costume dramas, others, and which can we can. Then Buddhism, it was mentioned by Mr. Wu, the Buddhism, you know, then we made, took an initiative in India during the visit of uh, President Park Gyun Hye. Uh, we have the Mahabodhi tree uh, in Gaya under which Lord Buddha attained uh, enlightenment. And we very rarely give a sapling to any country. We have given it to, to Thailand. I think we have given it to one more country. Uh, Japan we gave. So similarly, we presented a sapling of from the Mahabodhi tree, which is 2,500 years old, and uh, with the in the expectation at that time that you know it'll become a place of pilgrimage, it'll become a place of uh, as it grows up, a temple in a, one of the existing Buddhist temples, it'll be established so that you know it can become a symbol of India-Korea friendship, and it is at the moment in the Korean Arboretum. And there have been some efforts made, I think, in Gimhe, from Gimhe and Busan, etc. And even the, uh, one of the temples, I forget which one. But it's about time that we could look at this uh, proposal again, and it will yield dividends. Uh, one suggestion uh, which, you know, Korea is, uh, has, uh, Korean coaches are very, very, soccer coaches are accomplished. Uh, northeastern region is K-pop crazy. Again, a low-cost investment could be uh, the Korean soccer teams, uh, soccer coaches, creating a soccer team in Northeast India. Uh, I think it will be a winner all the way. Uh, and finally, we are very eagerly looking forward to the state visit of uh, President Moon Jae-in. He will receive a, a welcome which befits his, his stature and befits the friendship between our two countries. God bless you all. Come, Samrita. Thank you, Vishnu. Now we move on quickly to our two discussants. Uh, to begin with, we have uh, Professor Jiwan Wang from University of Seoul, followed by Professor Jayanti Raghavan from Jawaharlal Nehru University. You have 10 minutes each. Uh, thank you, uh, the Chairman. <clears throat> uh, my name is Jiwan Wang, and I teach it at in the University of Seoul. So actually my university is the Seoul Metropolitan University, which is you know, deeply connected to the Seoul Metropolitan Government. So I was really surprised to hear that there is no the sister city partnership between New Delhi and <laughs> Seoul. I really go to the, the, the my university president and also the, the mayor of Seoul, and then they talk about you know, the building or the partnership between the two capital uh, cities. <clears throat> uh, and actually, the, what is surprising to me is that th this is my first visit to India, <laughs> although I traveled more than 50 countries <laughs> so far. Then this, this visit is, uh, means a lot to me, actually. So that's why I, I'm really happy to talk about the public diplomacy between uh, the between uh, the the India and South Korea, but I think that the our public diplomacy is not just uh, the the one way one, but uh, just uh, the mutual public diplomacy, and also should go beyond the just politics and the economy. So I say that the argue for the mutual public uh, diplomacy between India and South Korea. So it, so it means that it's necessary to go beyond just the traditional uh, public uh, diplomacy. As far as I understand that just traditional diplomacy uh, that we uh, talk about is just uh, the one way from just to, uh, from the government to the, uh, the, the public, uh, the general public. 
And I would like to argue for the, the communication be- of the general public between the India and South Korea. So, so I call it the mutual public uh, diplomacy, not just the South Korean government to the Indian uh, the general public, all uh, the Indian uh, government to the South Korean uh, general public. So it would be really important to think about the roles played by the general uh, public and the non-governmental organizations. Uh, so maybe the uh, Yonsei, uh, the university, uh, East-West Center, and also the ORF, this kind of the exchange and partnership would be really important in building a new kind of uh, the cooperations uh, uh, between uh, two uh, mm-hmm. countries. And uh, I also argue uh, that I'd like to argue that this is really necessary to just us, for us to go beyond the, just the politics and the economy. The economic issues and political issues are important still, are very important. But, but we need to uh, come up with the new, you know, the the agendas. Uh, so so we need to think about uh, the how to build up our the new agendas and including what the, the ambassador said. Uh, but I, I would say that the first the development cooperation, uh, like the rural development and the education, something like that. And the second one is how to promote our the the the, the academics, the, the how to the communicate between the Korean studies and also the Indian uh, studies. The other one is uh, that the cultural exchange and tourism uh, that the ambassador uh, the emphasized that is also of course it will. Include the movies, uh, Bollywood, and also the the Korean movie. Korean movie is very popular in Korea and in these Asian uh, countries. And we also uh, the can can promote the uh, the pop cultures. And finally, uh, what's really important is that the young generations ex- exchange uh, program. Uh, first of all, uh, you know that development cooperation is really important between these two. Countries, you may have heard of that South Korea Semaul movement in our uh, when we developed our the economy and also the our the rural uh, the areas. <clears throat> so it could be a uh, some kind of of a project, you know, that between two countries uh, for to developing the Indian rural uh, development and also the Seoul Metropolitan Government is also the interest in the urbanization program issues. Maybe. In that areas that Seoul and New Delhi can, you know, the promote some kind of cooperation. That, of course, the infrastructure building, uh, including the transportation and the environment issues, and uh, you know that also in South Korea the fine dust is really serious, you know, uh, issues uh, in the South Korea's environment environment. And so, uh, I also heard that the. Development, uh, the innovation program by COICA is just initiated the last year, and it, it include that uh, the innovative partnership solution uh, IPS program, and I'm sure that this kind of pro- program will also to promote the partnership between two uh, uh, countries. And second, the Indian studies and Korean uh, studies. The the, the ambassador already uh, explained a lot about uh, that. We have very you know. Uh, the latter, you know, the uh, the shared, you know, things that uh, regarding our past history. So I started learning the world history after I read the, the your prime minister narrows the glimpses of world uh, history. And my daughter is now reading the same, you know, book that I read 20, uh, 30 years ago. And India is a rising power. Uh, of course, already the, you are great power. We are rising power, middle power, and we may. Uh, be able to, you know, uh, to come up with a new way of thinking about our the strategic, uh, the the thinking, and the Korean War in uh, during the Korean War, India, uh, Indian government uh, contributed a lot, especially in dealing with uh, the the prisoners of war uh, issues, uh, and Koreans are really interested in also the Indian uh, philosophy, and also religion, of course, uh, maybe, and. The cultural exchange and tourism is important. Our the ambassador uh, this morning talked about the International Day of Yoga and the three uh, actually three days ago that the the event the Korean event in the 
of the International Day of Yoga was held uh, the in downtown Seoul. Actually, this is a you may know that area. And this is a very the hot place in uh, downtown uh, Seoul. Just uh, that the Gwanghamun is the landmark of uh, Seoul, and behind that uh, the Gwang that the gate that there is uh, the the old Korean palace, and behind that there is uh, the presiden presidential uh, the office, the Chongha there. And it's actually the, just in front of the foreign uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, building. <laughs> and then, very hot place, you know, <laughs> very important. <laughs> and Koreans are really the uh, also the interest in Bollywood, but uh, maybe not really familiar with the Indian movies. Maybe uh, when you ask her, the Korean people about the Indian movie, maybe they will really say the Slum the Millionaire, but I know that is made in the, the Britain. But still, you know. Uh, explains a lot, describes a lot about the India. And there is also the India-related movie in Korea, The Finding Mr. Destiny, the story of the finding the ex-boyfriend <laughs> in India, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that's really popular. And of course, yoga and Taj Mahal. I really wanted to visit the Taj Mahal, but I heard that it is on the construction. Maybe the, maybe some yeah, construction open. now. It's open, still open? It's still yeah, open. yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will be back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, you may also invite me <laughs> again next time. Uh, okay, already the, the ambassador uh, explained a lot about the Korean image of India and the Indian image of uh, the Korea. Finally, uh, I want to the, uh, the, the emphasize the importance of the younger generation's exchanges, you know, that it's a really important to find the mutual interest and cooperation between two young generations. And uh, I spent one year, the last year, uh, in Washington, D.C., and as the visiting scholar, and then my daughter they also they went to the U.S., the American elementary school, and my daughter always, you know, talked to me that the Indian students is, are great. They are number one. <laughs> they are really good at mathematics and science. They are always beating Chinese students. <laughs> <laughs> so the Indian student are number one, <laughs> Korean student <is> number two, <laughs> Chinese student you know, number three. So we are beating the, the Chinese student there. So maybe we may be able to build some kind of partnership of the, the promoting the education, you know, uh, the, the science and mathematics science. Uh, Koreans are really interesting in, you know, the Indian student way of calculating that equation, <laughs> you know. And my uh, my wife is really the envious of the Indian mom who have very smart uh, the the boys and uh, girls. So uh, we may also be able to some have some, you know the partnership cooperation uh, in education area uh, is passed not only the, the mathematics and science, but also in the English, uh, the education. So uh, still, uh, while I prepared for this presentation, I was really surprised to know that the, this kind of the uh, exchange and cooperation between two countries are underdeveloped, you know? Surprisingly underdeveloped, but which means that we have a lot of things uh, to do uh, for both of us to promote that our the partnership uh, in the uh, future. Thank you. Thank you much, Professor. And now we have uh, Professor Jayanti Raghavan from Jawaharlal Nehru University. being done here to, uh, to build up awareness about Korea amongst uh, KCC, Korean Culture Center, does the same things what you experimented with Ambassador Prakash uh, in, um, uh, in, in Korea. They have essay contests, they have uh, road shows, they have quizzes, they have singing competition, and the uh, winners get prizes to go to Korea and have a, a you know, homestay as well. So, you know, those kind of things are being done by Korean Culture Center on a 
a very large scale. And uh, seeing from the kind of popularity Korea has gained, Korean language and culture has gained in India, uh, just by sheer statistics, I'll just give you an example uh, that uh, Korean language in the late 90s, um, if out of the total applicants for foreign languages were uh, a thousand, out of them only about 20 would apply for Korean. And that too, not as their first preference, but as uh, a second preference or a third preference. But now, we have one in every 20, one in every 20 applicants who apply for Korean as their first preference. It's not that we take all of them, we are unable to accommodate, and uh, we are able to take only about 30 students a year to teach Korean language. And, uh, and the number of institutions that are teaching Korean language are also increasing. And uh, uh, yes, translating translated storybooks distribution also Korean Culture Center is, and it's very, very popular. Korean culture is becoming popular. Students are beginning to learn the language, not because just because of the employment opportunities, but out of interest, out of the interest for uh, uh, Korean drama, Korean K-pop, and uh, they're forever, when they have free time, they are watching Korean drama, not those who are learning Korean, not just those students learning other foreign languages as well. So this is all very encouraging. Yet, yet, yes, why is, are the numbers, percentages so few? Why is it that we still, uh, Korea does not figure in the psyche of, of Indians? I think a lot more needs to be done. Uh, um, we, we still, the scale is very small and there is scope for expansion uh, in all these fields. Uh, Korean government did show serials, Korean serials on prime time. In fact, they chose uh, the Doordarshan, which has widest circulation and viewership and prime time, they took the slot and showed some of the serials with subtitles, yet it didn't catch on to the extent that uh, they would have liked. So uh, all that aside, this was only to say that uh, things are happening and there is scope for further improvement. Yes, uh, universities, uh, Indians are not aware that Korean universities are world class as well. Something that you mentioned, that needs to be promoted. Secondly, Koreans, uh, Indians think that if they have to spend money and go and study somewhere, they'd much rather go to the US or to England, or Oxford, Cambridge, than to go to Korea to study, not being aware of the level, of the standards, how well Korea figures in the um, uh, international ranking. So that needs to be promoted. Secondly, that education is available in English, that they can study. Unlike the time when I went in the late 70s, I had to study in Korean. I did Korean history in Korean, wrote my dissertation in Korean. And it was impossible, but it, very, very difficult, yet Korean people being so warm, they made you felt comfortable, they helped you. The study circles helped me to, they, they are really genuinely warm people who um, help, you show a little bit of interest and they help you overcome the obstacles. But now all that is not needed. It is uh, available, you can study in English. Tourism, Korea needs to promote itself as a country where vegetarian food is available. You see, that is the main problem with Indians is that um, they think, oh, it's a dog eating community. Oh, it is beef. Yeah, oh, they eat a lot of pork. They are not aware that a large component of Korean food is vegetarian also. It's only the, the, the non-vegetarian is one dish. And, so, and in Korean psyche as well, they need to know that when we say we are vegetarian, then you're not 
supposed to even touch the spoon with that. You cannot use this chopstick to eat your meat and use the same chopstick to pick out your vegetarian thing. The other person, the vegetarian, will not uh, even eat out of it. So these cultural understandings don't exist. Korea does not know what India means by vegetarianism. And Indians don't know that vegetarian food is available. In fact, Korea needs to do a lot more uh, in promoting and making available pure vegetarian rest restaurants. Restaurants where even non-vegetarian is not cooked. Just a few, one or two, uh, uh, but publicize the fact that these are available then you will have a lot more of those Gujarati moneyed people who travel all over uh, traveling to Korea as well. Uh, that said, just two points, uh, uh, I, I feel that more than all this, it is the cultural non-verbal traits that Indians have to become sensitive to when dealing with. We've talked about a lot of economic cooperation. We've talked about a lot of diplomatic cooperation and various fronts. But underlying all those, there is a cultural understanding, which is a must, which is not there at present. Indians need to understand how important it is for a Korean to create the punigi. Yeah. Of any situation creating a punigi, punigi being the environment how important it is. It is environment, not external environment of having the right temperature for your AC or the right infrastructure or your, it's the software being, coming ready for any event. You come prepared when, when you know that this is what is going to happen, you come prepared and if it is a Korean, make sure the preparedness is with data. Yes, it has to be statistics. It has to be data. Uh, Ambassador Prakash uh, told us for the experience he had of not having the data. The Koreans can relate only to numbers. So you have to know, oh, OK, uh, JNU, how big? You can't say, oh, it's very big. No. <laughs> how many acres? Yeah. How many schools? How many centers? Numbers. Give them numbers, and they, then they would sort of talk to you on a one-to-one. -one. So that is. The punigi involves coming prepared for the situation with everything and creating a right response. You come with the right mental attitude that I am going to make this work. Today, we are meeting, we are going to make this work. So what is it that I need to go to the meeting with? Okay, this, I need to prepare this. I need to know the other opponents, uh, what are the things that they are. This is, you have to judge assess what is, the, what is it that they will come with, which is called nunchi. Their nunchi, the sixth sense, the shrewdness, the, is so uh, perfect that they, they are able to adapt to any situations very quickly. They take advantage. The reason for their success is because they are able to assess. Uh, 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 Dr. Kim talked about how they know that now North Korea, re, they know reunification is there. It's a future target. You prepare, start, the preparedness begins with getting your youth, which is no, not favorable to it. You have to prepare them, change their mindset, their psyche. So the kind of preparedness, the kind of shrewdness with which they go to any situation and uh, come out winners, I think there's a lot that we Indians could learn from. The work culture, yeah? So this affects what they call as the kibun. The punigi affects their kibun, kibun being the mental and the physical state of well-being. So everything in a coordination re get, gets the right results. We, uh, so, so the culturally, it's a very short time to be able to explain, but anyway, having said this, I'll just leave it at that, that there is a lot of cultural uh, things that we could learn, work culture that we could learn from the Koreans. And uh, to make the best of our demographic dividend that somebody mentioned about, uh, which is lacking, we could 
learn from them how to educate the masses, how to involve civil society to educate the masses, not can't leave it to the government. It's too big a responsibility. They can't. It is too large a number, too large a number. It's practically not possible for a government to take care of. It's now the civil society. How do you motivate the civil society is something we could learn from the Koreans. And uh, nutrition. The dividend, the, our workforce will not become a demographic dividend if you do not educate them, you do not provide the kind of food for them. The, the mal malnutrition is a major malice in India. So these are areas where we sit together, maybe uh, you know, you, while talking trade, we can also look at what, how they come prepared, learn the cultural trade and think, and uh, yeah, meaning this too short. I have not been able to convey what I wanted to convey, but uh, with that I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have been able to convey that, have been able to convey that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Indians are more nunchi than punigi. <laughs> Well, whatever I understood. <laughs> no, but more seriously, I think uh, there are areas, as you say, you know, you talked of nutrition and things like that. There are things India needs. And I think if a country uh, is seen to be helping India in some of those areas, I think that is also public diplomacy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is very important. So, in, so our, again, we come back that we should not remain in this bubble. There are a lot of things happening outside the bubble, but more visibility, more long-term visibility, more uh, more uh, active participation of civil society, which takes the message to a far more audience. Okay, I think we've uh, finished the presentations and the discussions. If there is any comment or any observation or any question, we can take a couple of them because we have really run out of time now. So please raise your hand. Uh, uh, yes, Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, I chose this. Because the impression was that I was not saying the good things. So I, it's just an occasion in the right thing because I want to say certain good things. Uh, firstly, I had mentioned what was the name of that... Uh, Canal, the uh, Chang'e Chang. It uh, you know things that we can learn that uh, how uh, a drain could be converted into a river, a canal, which becomes a public space and cultural space. Another thing you talked about uh, preparedness. I I stayed in a Airbnb and our hostess when we were uh, arrived there. She had laid out the dining table with small pebbles on which she had written the names of me and my wife and all. All of it was laid down very beautifully using her creativity. And I think that's what you mean by preparedness. So these were some. And another thing I learned is that in Shaul, the bottled water is actually tap water. What you find, uh, what we have to pay for 20 rupees for getting a bottle. It is tap water, and that's that's the quality of water. Well, yes. Those are all very true. Anybody else? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all the contributions that we've had. And uh, <clears throat> there is a long road ahead. And I think uh, we do realize that. And uh, um, understanding culture is very important, uh, particularly in India, where we 
Um, we take great pride in our Jugaad culture, what we say. I don't know if anybody understands that, but uh, the Koreans may not, because they don't, uh, they don't go that way. And, uh, but I think uh, what, what, we, what we need to do, I think, after all this is to make it carve out three or four areas where uh, some concentrated effort can be put, rather than talking about a very broad canvas. Maybe education could be one. I think tourism is one because I've personally been in it and seen how it works and how how it has it has helpful in raising you know tourism and uh, the people's sort of interest in those countries. So with that, I think we'll conclude this session. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming, and uh, let's hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.